Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant will meet with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other senior officials today. This is as the U.S. is part of a ceasefire negotiation that is ongoing as we speak, while Israel continues to argue that an invasion of Rafah is necessary. The visit follows progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's forceful speech on the House floor on Friday, where she issued scathing remarks directed at Israel. Let's take a look. There is hardly a single hospital left. And this was all accomplished, much of this accomplished, with U.S. resources and weapons. If you want to know what an unfolding genocide looks like, open your eyes. Now, AOC had shied away from explicitly labeling Israel's campaign in Gaza a genocide, but she's standing by her words. Speaking with CNN's Jake Tapper on uh, the State of the Union on Sunday, on State of the Union, the show on Sunday, she doubled down accusing Israel of genocide of Palestinians and her call for President Biden to cut off aid to the U.S.'s ally, Israel. Multiple governments, NGOs, and even officials within the United States State Department have stated themselves plainly that the Israeli government and leaders in the Israeli government are intentionally denying, blocking, and slow walking this aid and, and are precipitating a mass famine. I believe we have crossed the threshold of intent. The Anti-Defamation League went after AOC, posting, quote, genocide requires intent, and Israel has been patently clear with its objectives to cripple Hamas terrorists and release the hostages. AOC's accusation lacks proper factual or legal foundation. Such statements merely perpetuate false claims and foster hate. Now, AOC clapped back yesterday, saying starving a million innocent people to death by halting and slowing U.S. humanitarian assistance is a massive, deliberate choice. Not only is it irrelevant to those objectives, it brings them further out of reach and endangers hostages. There is no defense for forced famine. Okay, so this is an interesting development. As we remember, we did a story on how AOC was um, getting confronted as she was leaving a, new, uh, a movie theater a few weeks ago for seeming soft on this issue to the left avoiding the use of the word genocide. And even now that she's made these statements on the House floor, there are some on the left that say, hey, this is too little too late. You have waited to a point where it is clear what is going on, where over 31,000 people have died, where all of these humanitarian um, groups, as she pointed out in the clip with Jake Tapper, have come forward and said, famine is not accidental. Famine is a choice. We have covered the um, the much diminished volume of trucks that are going into Gaza, food and aid trucks that are going into Gaza now as compared to before October 7th, when already, again, as we've covered, Gazans were on what is what was described as a just above starvation diet, just giving them enough calories to not starve. Um, so it seems a little bit like what now that the consensus has emerged, she is speaking out forcefully and strongly. Of course, others appreciate that effort. But as we just heard, others very much don't appreciate that effort. And she has gotten all this blowback uh, from the ADL as a consequence of pointing out what, again, so many humanitarian organizations have said, which is that this famine is occurring as a consequence of a choice by Israel not to let in additional aid. Yeah, I mean, for me, this is a real let them fight moment between two entities, between AOC and the ADL, neither of whom I have a, a lot of... Uh, Sympathy for, or you know, obviously part of my ideology. I'm not on the left. I have been extremely critical of the ADL in many contexts for, in my view, routinely um, inflating or miscounting hate crime statistics to make it sound like things are always getting worse. I've been very critical of what they have accomplished on um, social media, on X specifically, in terms of um, punishing people for what I think is free speech. So it is interesting for me to see them, you know, feuding with with AOC, you know, trying to quibble with her over definitions. Um, AOC's evolution here is itself interesting, as you've pointed out, because she was kind of, I think, trying to basically just avoid talking about this for a long time, and now clearly is, you know, reading the political winds and thinks that's no longer tenable, as are many other people in the Democratic coalition. Um, look, I, I, at the end of the day, I <laughs> share that goal. I have shared that goal all along, that I would not send additional military funds to Israel or, frankly, anyone else. Um, so if that is, the, if, in terms of the policy goal, I guess I am on the same page with her on that. Um, that would, I think, 
make the U.S. ultimately safer if we were not seen as complicit in what um, people in the Middle East, uh, th this horror show you're seeing in Gaza, and um, and and that you know I I also take umbrage at the idea that we would have to bl blow up the whole place and then also and then pay for it to be rebuilt as seems to be. Uh, the case. So um, I don't know. I think that's the right policy. I, I, mean, I think the policy is totally unre unrealistic. Unfortunately, there's like, what, 15 percent of Congress, if that, that wants to actually cut off the aid to Israel? Yeah. So that's what I was going to go to next, that, again, AOC was part of the very small cohort that didn't just vote uh, on Friday to pass another $3.8 billion of aid to Israel at the very same time that they codify cutting off UNRWA support through 2025. So at the same time that UNRWA support, again, UNRWA is the primary boots on the ground aid organization in the Gaza Strip, is being stripped of substantial amounts of its funding. It's in a deep funding deficit because of the U.S. choices to cut aid because of allegations that for uh, UNRWA members out of the 30,000 or so that are operating in the region were alleged to have participated on October 7th. Consequently, accusations against the Israeli media, uh, military, media posted by members of the military themselves, showing them um, playing with beach balls on the in, in Gaza, saying the things like they, what they are looking forward to it being a de beach development, holding women's underwear, something that is being investigated, or as we're going to discuss in another uh, segment, drone footage, idea of drone footage that shows what seems to be a summary execution of four Palestinian youths as they pick through the rubble that used to be their house. None of that has resulted in an abridgment of U.S. aid, even though we have laws on the books that preclude us from giving aid to people who are conducting war crimes. And, and I think this is important. There, the pushback from the ADL says, what about intent? The intent is one of the things that the ICJ preliminary ruling said was the most clear, that usually it's difficult to prove genocide because people don't, generally speaking, broadcast their genocidal intent to eliminate a population. In this case, you have people like Gov Gallant, who is here talking with uh, Blinken right now, saying things like, um, we need to have a complete siege. He was the one, if you recall correctly, who made uh, the statement. Uh, I want to quote him directly so I don't misattribute um, uh, or mischaracterize him in, in the least. Uh, he's the one that said, no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel will be allowed into Gaza. Quote, we are fighting human animals and we act accordingly. That, along with dozens and dozens of other statements, were put forward in the South African ICJ petition as evidence of why what is happening in Israel is not, uh, in Gaza rather, is not incidental to the project of eliminating Hamas, but part and parcel of a collective punishment, a purpose to use um, isn't he harm to, to the. Isn't he referring to Hamas there in those statements? No. When you say that you're not going to provide electricity and food to 2.3 million people in an entire area, unless you're claiming that all of those people are Hamas, which other Israeli officials have done, saying there are no civilians, everyone is Hamas, that is called collective punishment, and that is a war crime. That is saying we're going to abuse, starve, diminish, bomb, kill the rest of a civilian population to force the target to surrender, and that is against uh, international law. Mm. Well, meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris acknowledged attacking Rafa would be a misstep on Israel's part. In every way that any major military operation in Rafa would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. And we're looking at about a million and a half people in Rafa who are there because they were told to go there, most of them. And so we've been very clear that um, it would be a mistake to move into Rafah with any type of military operation. A mistake, but would there be consequences if he does move forward? Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. Yeah, so that's interesting. The administration has got itself into this this quagmire, mm -hmm. where they can't say, you know, Biden has said there's a red line. They understand that the public is requiring of them some pushback against 
the right wing Netanyahu regime. I mean, this is so contrary to what we've heard at press conferences where they say, well, we're not going to micromanage the Israeli military strategy. Now she's, that was explicitly micromanaging the Israeli military strategy. Well, yes and no. First of all, I think it's always been absurd for the spokesmembers or, or Biden to say about Israel, well, we can't weigh in on what they do because that's not what America does, interfere in other people's politics. That's absurd, one, because we do constantly, and two, because you have Netanyahu and other members of the Israeli government literally doing press tours, separately speaking to Republican members of Congress because the Democrats wouldn't speak to them openly lobbying the U.S. both uh, in using the media and APAC, which is an extremely powerful, deeply funded lobbying group that spends a, a, and openly brags about its ability to influence U.S. electoral outcomes. So that's one part of it. But the other part of it is that the Biden administration has been trying to have it both ways. They see the pushback from the public. They see that people are upset. He sees himself about to potentially lose the election over um, voters across the country, but specifically in Michigan, saying that this is a red line for me. So he feels compelled to say things like he did in that Jonathan Capehart interview a few weeks ago. Hey, there is a red line. But in the same breath, he says, even though I have a red line, Rafa is my red line, I'm not actually going to enforce it by ever withholding any aid from Israel. And so it's the, the administration not, is now in this position, and Kamala Harris is in this position of looking very weak by rhetorically saying, yes, we have our own boundaries, but neutering that statement by immediately following up with, well, I don't actually ever plan to do anything that would cut aid to Israel. Hmm. Now we'll have to see how this develops. We'll have more rising right after this.